John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I f***ing love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that Boston next. Big jab there from Duffy and Fred Fear is hurt now. Oh, down goes Duffy O'Connor. Fred Fear does it again. Rock em, sock em, robots here. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self-involved bull artists. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Oh, give me all of the pay-per-view week, Boston, Massachusetts. I've been listening to Leon Edwards' walkout song, Shabamata Pot, all morning. Check it out, Ken Flo. Great to have you with us. One of the bigger weeks in the history of the Anakin Florian podcast. It is Monday, August 14th, 2023. Episode 429 of the Anakin Florian Podcast, presented by DraftKings. We are on the DraftKings Network, the DraftKings YouTube channel. Thanks thanks in advance for liking and subscribing on our behalf. Trying to make it as easy as possible, by the way, to find the show. And we're told that when you like the show, that helps you navigate it and find it. Uh, UFC 292 beckons in Boston, Massachusetts. We have a lot to get to today. Going to recap Vicente Luque's big win over Rafael Dos Anjos. Later in the week, we will have a second episode. We'll get you Ken Flo's picks on UFC 292. We're also scheduled to talk to UFC middleweight contender, the action man, the king of combat, Chris Curtis. Obviously a huge week for Ray Longo. Ken Flo as big, I would say, as any in his career. No pressure, Raymond. Uh, He's scheduled to join us here in about 25 minutes. But a lot to get into, of course, a big UFC fight night at the Apex. So uh, in the nature of not wasting any time, let us get to headlines. Headlines. It's time for headlines. I have some very urgent and important breaking news. Headlines. On the John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. So I'll be in Boston. You'll be in New York. PFL, Friday, August 18th. So uh, it's too bad. We might have seen you at, uh, at the jungle there at TD Garden. But uh, alas, it won't it won't be happening. I know, man. Like two ships passing in the night. All right, so uh, what is going on in my headset? Thank you. That silence is wonderful right now. So, uh, all right, let's get into this UFC fight night, shall we? Told you Khalil Roundtree Jr. was frightening. And I love that the guy comes out and asks for a main event. But we will begin with that main event. And Vicente Luque, with a lot of, I think, internal pressure on himself in this spot, just given the medical stuff, gets it done over Rafael Dos Anjos by unanimous decision, 49-46, 48-47, times two big performance some might suggest he turned the tide on rda a little bit when it came to the grappling and the wrestling what were your thoughts on uh a big much needed win for uh the silent assassin vicente luca yeah no question about it listen you know given the odds i'm not sure i would change my pick i still think it was worth it uh going with rda um i thought there was value there but when they kind of got close to each other and they started walking towards each other to, to start that fight i go Oh, boy, this is going to be a long night because Luque looked massive. I mean, he's a proper welterweight, right? And RDA uh, really is a bloated uh, lightweight Um, and not fat. I'm talking about muscular, muscular lightweight, right? But uh, not bloated in that aspect, but inflated, I should say. And he's just not as big as someone like Luque who looked massive. And I think because of that, he was winning a lot of those grappling exchanges, not only because, yes, he is technical and he's, Uh, Very aware as far as a lot of those grappling exchanges, but his size made it very difficult for RDA to win a lot of those exchanges. Even when he was doing the right thing, Luque's size, his ability to get proper positioning was making it extra difficult on RDA. So, um, And I thought that that was RDA's best chance at winning that fight. Yes, he could land some good shots, and he was. I thought he was landing some great body kicks. I thought he landed some good hooks, some good left hands. But again, anytime you have two masses that are colliding, that larger mass is going to win the majority of those exchanges, especially when you have a guy who... I thought looked as defensively sound that I've seen him in a very long time in Vincente Luque. Yeah, protecting that head and everywhere else. And uh, you just got to feel good for him. If you don't know, you know, his brain scan was not ideal. And uh, there was a question, I think, from him as to whether or not he would ever compete again. And he wasn't really fearful of the medical issue as much as he was fearful that mixed martial arts was going to be taken away from him. And uh, it can be taken away in the blink of an eye and i'm just happy for vicente luque just really good man good team 
And uh, I guess this puts him in position for another big fight. You know, it's getting awfully crowded at the top of this welterweight division. You know, I know in spending some time with Bilal Muhammad in Nashville, Tennessee, it's like, what is going on? Like, why do Colby Covington and Leon Edwards not have a date if indeed that is what's going to happen? Um, but this positions Luke, he he had called for Dustin Poirier, I think potentially if Poirier moves up to welterweight. And I think that fight would have some level of intrigue, even though I'm not sure that that is uh, at the top of, of Dustin Poirier's welterweight hit list. But uh, what are your thoughts on Vicente Luque now moving forward in uh, a division full of killers? Yeah, listen, uh, I, I think there's no shortage of high-level competition in that division. I think getting a win over RDA uh, is awesome um, and puts him back on track. Uh, and I, I think he was, what, number 10? Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of different uh, I- exciting matchups. Of course, you have Kevin Holland, who's behind him, uh, I think, at number 12. Um, and Shavkat Rachmanov, does he have a dance partner at this stage of the game? So a lot of these guys are teammates. So Shavkat Rachmanov was to face Kelvin Gastelum September 16th, Mexican Independence Day in Las Vegas. I believe that was going to be the co-main event underneath the Alexa Grasso, Valentina Shevchenko rematch. But Gastelum like shattered his nose or something. So Rachmanov needs an opponent. And uh, I think he and Poirier have actually had some back and forth. But you got a lot of these Kill Cliff FC guys near the top of this division. And yeah. that isn't to say that Ian Gary wouldn't fight Gilbert Burns for the title, but he's not going to fight him before a world title fight. So a lot of these guys wouldn't necessarily fight Gilbert Burns and Vicente Luque, incidentally, are like best friends. So that's not going to happen. Jeff Neal, number eight in the world, of course, is on the mend. We'll get clarity this weekend with Neil Magny and Ian Machado Gary. But you're right, Kevin Holland, potentially an option. Jack Della Maddalena needs a fight. Not sure if he'd be... Yeah, Sean Brady, too, who could be able to make a turn after uh, he was idled by uh, a nasty staph infection. Yeah, we'll see what happens, but... uh, Nonetheless, Luque is in the mix, certainly more so than Rafael Dos Anjos. By the way, you can hear on the broadcast, so RDA, as many of you know, was in California for the bulk of his prime, then moved his family back to Brazil, and now is back in Austin, Texas. So it's always oh. interesting for me, you know, come on back, yeah. RDA. Come on back to the United States of America. <laughs> A lot of things going on in Texas. Maybe you can do the Joe Rogan experience. So uh, we got to get into the co-main event. We got to get into Khalil Roundtree Jr., but big ups to Vicente Luque. And Rafael Dos Anjos, it really is going to be interesting because I read somewhere that maybe he has five fights left on his UFC contract, and all of those are six-figure paydays, and I hope he gets to realize a lot of those. But I'm just not sure, uh, you know, that the ceiling is championship at this point, 170 pounds, given the setback. We'll see. Uh, I think MMAJunkie.com mentioned Gunnar Nelson as a possible, a possible opponent. For RDA, and uh, I wouldn't bat an eye at that. But let us get to uh, what was a four hundred and sixty dollar loss for Kenny Florian in the co-main. Oh. And as I've said all year, unmistakably, these fights have gone against you all year long, and it's a huge swing, right? You go two unis on Hakeem Dawadu, right? So instead of being plus two hundred on this fight. You're minus 460. It's a $660 swing, and it's a huge swing in our main event challenge, which we'll get to with Brian Petrie later in the week. But it's Cub Swanson with Children Octagon side by unanimous decision, 29-28 times three. He was clapping for Hakeem Dawadu. Be careful I don't offend everybody in the judging space today on the program, right? And our guy Sean Sheehan, uh, the Criteria Police. Love you, Sean. Uh, But Ken Flo... Most of the MMA masses, including Cub Swanson himself, felt like Hakeem Dawoodu got it done. We had echoed aloud on the podcast last week that Hakeem dawoodu has got to put somebody away every three or four years. He was unable to do that, paid the ultimate price this weekend. But a lot of us felt like Dawoodu was up 2-0 going into that third and final round. Killer Cub Swanson included. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I think it's great to see Cub fight well. I, I, I did think he lost that fight, but he fought well. He certainly fought way better than he was when he was fighting at 135 pounds, which was too big of a weight cut, in my opinion. Just looked weak, didn't have that same energy. In this fight, I thought he looked very good. I thought he was moving well. Um, he was responding to the shots very well, but I think his volume was a little down in, in comparison to to Dawadu, I thought Dawadu was also landing the harder strikes overall as well. And because of that, I had Cub Swanson down two rounds heading into round three. I thought he won round three, which was great because of the fact that, you know, you, you can question someone like, uh, you know, a Cub Swanson who's been around for a long time. You know, does he still have it? Is he still training hard? What's his motivation like? 
all those questions were answered. He still wants it very badly. His motivation was there. His conditioning was there. But I don't think he need, he did enough to win that fight. And you know, you know what I'm sick of, of hearing on the internet, especially guys that kind of been around this sport for a while, is when guys go, well, guys, it was a close fight. Why is everyone freaking out about this? Well, it doesn't matter. These guys are competing for their livelihoods, for their jobs, for their families. And when you have a close fight, it does not matter. In the Olympics, in swimming, in sprinting, you have you know the difference of 0. 0.002 or 0. 0.01. These are minuscule amounts, but we always have a winner that was supposed to win, and we always have a loser that was supposed to lose or come in second or third or whatever that is because we have these great abilities to measure the difference of who won and who lost. And, you know, obviously it is judging. It is not absolute. We're not talking about math with a stopwatch, but we are so inconsistent in how we judge these fights. And it, it just, it ticks me off as someone who used to be in there and someone who corners people from time to time that I don't have a, a clear direction in what my fighter is supposed to be doing when he's out there and who wins and who loses. Um, and, and I'm sick of hearing, well, it's okay. It was close. Why is everybody freaking out? Everybody's freaking out because there's a lot on the line that could determine a title shot or not, or a resurgence in their career or, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or more uh, of a difference. So, you know, it absolutely does matter. And just because it's close doesn't mean it's okay. And, and that's the kind of, you know, stuff that I hear out there. And also, Cup is a great guy. It was awesome to see him, you know, do well out there. Did he deserve to win, though? I don't think so. And as you mentioned, I think Cub was absolutely sure that Dawadu won that fight. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was it was tough to see. But at the same time, you know, whether he won or lost, it was great to see Cub back on track at least as far as his skills his conditioning his motivation cub one of the nicest guys out there uh just thought that would do uh won that fight and again yeah it was a huge swing in the negative for old ken flow over here i'm glad you led with cub swanson's performance ron mccarthy jacob montalvo both had identical scorecards they gave cub round one they gave Hakeem Dawadu round two, and then they gave Cub Swanson round three. Now, all three judges gave Swanson round three. Sal Diamato gave Dawadu round one, then he was the dissenting judge who gave Cub Swanson round two. So, I like Ron McCarthy. I think he's had a lot of good scorecards over the last several months. But uh, this one is a little bit of a head-scratcher for me, for me. When I look at Cub Swanson in round one, it almost seems like, and I have said repeatedly, I just think we're getting a little bit too cute sometimes when it comes to the criteria. And I can get myself in trouble saying something like that because it all comes down to the criteria. Yet all the fighters seem to be aligned and not aligned with the judges like weekend in and weekend out. But it seems to me like Cub Swanson landed one big shot in round one, and that was enough to swing the pendulum on two of the three scorecards that mattered. Now, I don't love the fact that the judges had all these deferring scorecards, but Sean Sheehan would just tell me that these were all close rounds, and um, I guess I can lean into some of that, but I don't know, man. It's, uh, it's a really, really tricky thing. And uh, again, I'm not going to have the open scoring conversation today. I'm not going to have the five judges conversation today, but I do feel bad for Hakeem Dawadu. Uh, and, you know, when your opponent's clapping for you, it's just not a great visual for the judges. Yeah, for sure. So, um, but yes, I think it's, you know, Cubs 2-0 and with his kids in the building. It's just so weird, man. We talk so much about this. I talked to Michael Chandler about this when I was in Nashville. And this was not your reality, but we talked about Benil Daryush essentially with the daughter sleeping in the hotel room, you know, and Cub Swanson putting more pressure on himself with his three children, octagon side, right, in this quiet apex environment, you know. I don't know, man. Risk paid off, but my goodness, I'm thinking at the beginning of this fight, you know, Hakeem Dawadu is a sharp, fast striker, you know? Let's not yeah. be twitching on the canvas in front of the children. And he won the fight, so good on him. But Jesus Christ, with these fighters and their children. Like I, I, I've said repeatedly, like I'm a commentator. I don't want my kids anywhere near the <laughs> octagon. Yeah, listen, I, I think he, in theory, he made a good justification for it, right? In that he's saying, hey, I, I don't want to shield anything. I want them to be aware of this and what, what daddy does and all that stuff. 
But I do think that you know not all kids are ready for it at that at that stage of the game. Um, you know, some fully understand what is going on and what it means to get hit and and what hurt means. Uh, so you know, I, I'll hopefully that there's no there's no damage done or anything like that to the kids or there's no trauma or anything like that there. But um, I, I think it's valid. But I think you know every kid's different. The age is different, and um, you know certainly certainly took a risk there. Uh, you, you you don't want to see that. It's it, one of the worst visuals is when you see a kid yeah. see their parent get knocked out cold. Um, and yes, that's what they do. But uh, make no mistake about it, it's a very dangerous game. Last thing I'll say, it's lazy to suggest that you can just, you know, not leave it in the hands of the judges, right? But right. to what would you say of my criticism of Hakeem Dawadu that it's been several years since he has put somebody away? Maybe a crowd would have been different if they were reactive to Hakeem Dawadu's strikes, but the crowd was non-existent. This was at the UFC Apex. But what would you say to people like me who don't necessarily say, hey, well, don't leave it up to the judges, but we do say like, there is one way without open scoring to make sure that this doesn't happen. And you do what Ken Flo does, right? Put people out. <laughs> I mean, you try, you try anyway, for sure. Right. And, and I think that's, that's the key as a martial artist. What you're trying to achieve is basically decide the fight with your own hands, right? To the best of your ability. It doesn't always go that well. It doesn't always go that well. Certainly didn't for me all the time, but the, the idea is for, you know, you to, leave no question in in the in the minds of the judges to make it as dominant as possible if you can and i think that in regards to your question what i saw from dawadu and and hopefully he takes this as constructive criticism if he does listen to the show or see this is that to me it looked like there was a little bit of um sparring energy in that fight where it's like you're kind of going tit for tat a little bit you go then i go you have to be able to take that steering wheel and take control of that round to the best of your ability and and cub swanson obviously is is an unwilling participant in that dance however he had the ability to press more he had the ability to throw more volume i thought he was the quicker guy in some instances and i, I think that he allowed cub into those rounds a little bit to the point where yeah it was close i still think he won but i, I think that hurt him a little bit uh especially in round three when he allowed for that takedown and for that control um and it just seemed like he was a little bit too comfortable in that round uh, as opposed to really pressing the action and, and really trying to show people that he was out there to beat up cup swats and yeah. not just win a round Do, does that yeah. make sense yeah Perfectly put. And uh, yeah, I feel for Hakeem Dawadu, but I tell my kids all the time, right? There's just a lot of things in life that are not going to go your way. There's a lot of things that are pleasantries that are great. And then there's a lot of shit that you don't want to do that you're just going to have to do. One thing I would never do is sign a bout agreement to face Khalil Roundtree Jr. I actually would suggest if I'm a UFC light heavyweight, I might avoid this guy. Not that you don't think you can beat him, but my goodness, if you don't, the consequences are near fatal. I mean, this guy has so many thudding weapons jesus man like he didn't even connect clean and docus is uh you know his brain's hitting the other side of his head what do you have for us on khalil roundtree jr by tko at 240 around one well you bring it up perfectly because this is such a stark contrast from the energy of dawadu to the energy of khalil roundtree when he fights roundtree is trying to hurt you he's trying to take you out he's he doesn't want to leave any doubt in the mind of the judges and um you know the speed in which he moves the aggression in which he does things it's just it, it's unbelievable to watch it's a lot of fun to watch and you know i know that khalil at times um you know he can either love this game or hate this game uh, i know he works out very hard still all that stuff but i think now it's time for him to kind of start to make a run at doing something uh, in regards to a title shot in the future. I, I think he's ready. I think his skills have built up to the point where, um, you know, he's going to be dangerous against anyone now. Um, I know he's been working hard on his grappling skills to get that up in order. He's been working a lot on his strength and conditioning, all that stuff. But, um, man, just violence, you know, controlled violence, uh, it, I think is the perfect analogy for someone like Khalil Roundtree. He's looking great. It really wasn't much of a challenge against Dawkins, who at one point I thought was a very durable guy, even at heavyweight. Um, but, uh, man, you can drop so fast in this game. 
Uh, but Roundtree is ready for some higher level competition. I think it's time for him to start to make a serious run at uh, getting him to the top five. Yeah, I'll get back to Roundtree Jr. in a second, but you do feel for the Dawkins boys. Kyle's back to the regional circuit. He has won since being let go by the UFC. We'll see what they do with Chris Dawkins, but uh, I know he had high hopes for this light heavyweight fight against Khalil Roundtree Jr. and uh, did land one nice combination that uh, got Roundtree Jr.'s attention, but Khalil Roundtree Jr., my goodness, the guy's asking for a main event. I think he's worthy at this point in time, and I like when guys sort of try to position their careers. It's much yes. harder, I think, at times, not to suggest that Roundtree Jr. is going to get this main event, but sometimes it's harder to call your shot in terms of an opponent than it is to be like, hey, let me lay the foundation for a main event. I need to prove to myself in the world that I can go five hard rounds if need be. And I do think, generally speaking, they like to headline women and bigger bodies, heavyweights and light heavyweights. So is it out of the realm of possibility that the unranked, oh, number 13 in the world, excuse me, Khalil Roundtree Jr., now four wins in a row, I think, three of them by knockout or TKO. Jan Bohovic coming off a loss as number four in the world. You can do worse than a main event between Bohovic and Roundtree Jr. We'll see what happens with Anthony Smith and Ryan Spann. That's that is a fight in Singapore, actually 12 days from right now. Dominic Reyes is out there. Volkan Uzdemir, I think. Alexander Rakic always seems to be on the mend. Obviously, you got a lot of bigger names at the top of that division, but we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens for Khalil Roundtree Jr. I'd love to see him get the opportunity. I mean, he and Dustin Jacoby, you could do. I don't know if those guys could headline necessarily right now, but uh, Roundtree Jr., man, the world's his oyster. I'm happy to see it. Obviously, he's dealt with some mental demons and... Uh, yeah, this uh, this like mystic Thailand Khalil Roundtree Jr. punishing fighter is uh, a real light heavyweight problem, Ken. No question about it, dude. If I'm if I'm a guy like Rakic who's got a a bad wheel, or you know, even for uh, uh, Jamal Hill or any of those guys who oh, have yeah. you know coming back leg injuries, no, 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 don't don't fight Roundtree because he will he will chop that leg down, uh, and it might just take one kick. That that's how explosive this kid is. Last year, Roundtree uh, defeated Dustin Jacoby, so I guess they wouldn't run that back. Thank you, Cody Merrow, at the uh, screws always on it. All right, we'll see what happens, but uh, I got to feel good for Khalil Roundtree Jr. All right, I just want to shout out a couple of prelim performances. Uh, a couple of these, actually, my teammates, Damon Blackshear with a twister against Jose Johnson. Not a lot of these in UFC history, Ken Flo, so just the third the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung, Bryce Mitchell, and now one Damon Blackshear. Yeah, it was awesome. By the way, shout out to my guy, DC. Uh, Cormier was on it, dude. He saw it coming from a mile away. I sent him a text message. I was like, dude, your grappling knowledge was on point all night. Um, sounded like a high-level jujitsu black belt all night, man. He was singing a lot of these exchanges coming, uh, not only in that fight, but uh, in a lot of different fights with sweeps and attacks and, th and things like that. So shout out to DC. But um, yeah, man, that, that twister was nasty. And, and it puts so much torque on the whole of the spine, the neck, the lower back. Uh, and it just feels like you're, you're, you're getting twisted up literally, right? Why they call it the twister. And it's nasty. It it's, it's definitely involves pain and withstanding pain. But I think it's one of those that really could do a lot of damage to the spine and, and it forces someone uh, oh. to tap out before there's a serious injury. So it, it's a nasty one. But that was beautiful. And that takedown that he hit as well was gorgeous. And I mentioned him as my team. And I've never crossed paths with him at the Institute of Human Performance, but that's where he does his strength and conditioning. Shout out to Jackie Amarim as well, getting her first UFC win and proudly rep at IHP. Terrence McKinney with a huge win. You know, he fought Nas not all that long ago and stepped up on short notice. He gets past Mike Breeden. No bonus for him, but he steps up on short notice, gets a TKO, and uh, back over 500 in his UFC career. Marcus McGee gets a bonus for his knockout of J.P. Bays. Brian Petrie called for the round one knockout there. Josh Fremd by unanimous decision. Same for A.J. Dobson, who gets his first UFC win. Anything else, Kenny, that I'm missing on this UFC fight night? I don't think so, man. Uh, Amarim looked great. Her positioning was awesome. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it, man. You got it. All right, we'll see if Longo has anything else. Ray Longo coming up in 60 seconds, but you all know what it is. UFC 292 is Cannonball coming. A Bantamweight Championship banger set to headline the card this weekend. In the hub, Boston, Massachusetts, Aljamain Sterling looking to remain the hunted. As he takes on top contender Sugar Sean O'Malley, will Aljo keep his title, or is it the challenger's time to shine? We'll get your bets in now at DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of UFC. New customers can bet just $5 to get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Right now, 
Sterling is the favorite, minus 270. O'Malley comes back, plus 220. Maybe you like the Sugar Show by knockout, plus 350. Sterling can be had by submission at plus 200. Perhaps that sweetens some things for you. A lot of different ways to attack the board, so download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code AFPOD. New customers can bet just $5 on UFC 292 to get $150 in bonus bets instantly. That is this Saturday, only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code AFPOD. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER in New York. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net in partnership with Hollywood Casino at Charlestown Races. All games regulated by the West Virginia Lottery. Please play responsibly. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Terms at sportsbook.draftkings.com slash MMA terms. All right, I'm getting nervous just thinking about all that lies ahead for Ray Longo coming up on August 19th, but he does have 30 good minutes for us today. Let us get to the Ray Longo Minute. Now time for the Ray Longo Minute. I want you to punch a hole in this fucking chest. That's what I want. The Ray Longo Minute. Starring Ray Longo. The John Anik and Kenny Florian Podcast. All right, all groomed up. Ray Longo joins us live from Las Vegas. So uh, I would imagine this is somewhat of an inconvenience to be in Las Vegas for Dana White's Contender Series in one of the biggest weeks of your coaching career. I mean, I know they're all your students, Raymond, but... uh, Good morning to you on Pacific uh, Time here. This is crazy, John. I don't know what I signed up for, but this week, this if this week doesn't kill me, I'll be a, I'll, I'll live a long, a long life. Trust me. This was, this was tough, man. This was tough, but you know, I, I worked with Pompos. You know, I didn't think it was right if I didn't come, and um, you know, those guys left on Monday. I'll be back Tuesday. Drive up. Uh, I'll be back Thursday, Wednesday. Drive up Thursday. So. Kind of the same thing. It's just, will I make it is the problem. <laughs> it's all right. about me. It's right. all about me. I mean, can we get a wheelchair to take this guy to the gate? I mean, is that too much to ask? You need to rest your hip. Oh, man. And then he blacks out. I don't know if he liked that or not, but I don't at all want him to, uh, you know, put his hip in jeopardy for UFC 292. We're efforting to get Ray Longo back right now. I think I hear him. But no, it's uh, it's slow going on the hip right now. There's some long airport terminal walks in Las Vegas, and then he's flying back to Boston, obviously, with Chris Weidman and Aljamain Sterling. We're going to get into all of that stuff, but he has, of course, a local guy competing on the Contender Series uh, coming up here on Tuesday. So as of this taping, Mario Bautista does not have an opponent for UFC 292. Cody No Love Garbrandt, due to some injury, forced to pull out of the fight. And it remains to be seen as to whether or not Mario Bautista will still be on the card and there will probably be some reshuffling, but um, Randy Costa, the local has thrown his name into the hat. It would, it would be nice to get some local flavor on that 292 card. Got a lot of New Yorkers set to compete in Boston. We got your back, Raymond. Yes, we got you back. And let's put Pumi Nakuda in for Bautista. Throw his name in there. He's ready to go. Yeah, I saw him throw. That was one of the things I had on my list to discuss with you today. I saw him offer himself up. Uh, we'll see if they take the bait, but I think that would make a lot of sense, right, for him competing at 35? Yeah. He'll, he'll, yeah. Uh, yeah. He just wants to get in, so he'll do anything at this point. I think uh, that's that's the point of that, but I don't know. Let's just so, uh, uh, We need, some, we need team... some energy, guys. Kenny looks like he might be drifting. I don't know. What, do you, make for, what, what, what about my haircut? Let's start with the hair. You got your yeah. video. Kenny's on mute. We can't hear Kenny. So Kenny's going to need to unmute There we himself. go. Sorry. Your haircut looks yeah. great. The haircut right. looks great, Ray. This is the this is the yeah. knockout view. I'm mesmerized by the knockout uh-huh. view. I'm looking up at you like you just knocked me oh, out I of your shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, there we go. Uh-huh. I like it. There we go. I like there that. It is. Oh, and my arm, there it is. My arm won't last too long like this. <laughs> well, you're saying let's have fun with the haircut, Ray. You come on and, and seem particularly ornery to me out of the shoot today. I know it's 8.37 a.m. Pacific, right? And now I'm going to have the Minutemen all over me, right? Suggesting Ray's in a bad mood. But you come in, come in here today, <laughs> and I don't feel like you're in a great mood because you got a lot of heady over the next five days or so. Now he's smiling. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, 
I'm good. I'm good. All I'm right, just pissed good. off about the Wi-Fi, buddy. I'm yeah. Right. I'm really pissed off about it because it's part me being retarded. Uh, well, it's part me being stupid. And yeah. Part the All hotel right. has no Wi-Fi. I'm sorry that uh, you're at Palace Station, but it's a big week. And so in the nature of yeah. not burying the lead, while your Wi-Fi is decent, yes. we have to get to Chris Weidman and Aljamain Sterling and everything else. So there have been a lot of times in the eight, nine-year history of the Anakin Florian podcast where I have said to you, man, this week feels as big as any in your coaching career. This one just feels like the perfect storm of just high magnitude with Chris Weidman back from a broken leg for the first time in two years. And then, of course, Aljamain Sterling chasing further greatness. So I know you have this Tuesday competition in front of you first, but uh, what are your emotions like now five days out from uh, UFC 292? Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to stay busy, not, you know, think about too many things. Uh, I got a lot, a lot of shit on my plate. So, uh, you know, these are two guys that are really, you know, the crux and the heart of the team going together. Weidman's story is another crazy story in the history of MMA and for the gym. And, you know, Al Joe's, you know, man, he's, he's shooting for greatness, man. All his victories. I mean, he holds records in how many categories, right? And uh, this is just going to be the icing on the cake. I think it's a great fight. He looked great in the camp, had a great camp. Uh, I'm super – I'm just excited. I'm going to be excited one day at a time, though. Ray, uh, Chris already has a Hall of Fame career, right? Uh, Aljo, of course, as well. But, um, you know, for Weidman, I, I think about these leg breaks, man, and I always think about – the mental hurdles that you need to come back from, right? It's like just getting healthy where you could walk. Then it's okay. You could start your sparring. Uh, you can, you can kick now. You can kick with shin pads now, but then going into a fight for the first time, no shin pads, throwing kicks, defending kicks it, for any man, even guys who are as mentally tough as Chris Weidman, you know, it, it could be quite the challenge. How do you think Chris is going to respond to that first round in there in Boston. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something. I think if anybody could do it, it's him. Like it, the guy I knew my whole life was always this type of guy. It's not me, man. I'll be. I'll tell you one thing. I'll be nervous. I, I don't want to see the guy get hurt for sure. That would that would actually be horrendous. But he's he's in a good spot. I mean, he sounds great. Uh, he looked great when he was in the gym. And uh, like again, if anybody could do it, it's him. And I I think. I think you're going to see an aggressive Chris Weidman. So and, and I saw what, Brad Tavares, yeah. Kenny, at the Raiders game, yeah. and he had some silver hair. And so I was like, all right, well, Brad Tavares isn't like a spring chicken either. He's making his 23rd UFC appearance. But I will admit to being surprised at the money line. Brad Tavares is a pretty big favorite here, Ray. Are you surprised that Chris can be had right now, you know, plus well, 210 or so on DraftKings Sportsbook? Yeah, I just think there's a lot of uncertainty. You know what I mean? It's a, he's getting older. There's a long layoff. It was a leg break. I mean, no, I, I get it. I would have thought it would have been a little closer, though. I thought it would have been like a, in the plus 120 or even or something like that. Uh, but there's a lot of uncertainties here, and he's going to have to overcome those hurdles. And, like, again, I think if anybody could do it, it's Chris White. And as far as the challenge, Ray, of Brad Tavares, you know, he, he's a big, strong middleweight. Uh, he could be tough to take down. Uh, very good striker as well. How are you guys approaching this one? Uh, you know, look, I mean, we know where Chris's strengths lie. His stand-up is awesome. But uh, I think if he plays to his strengths in this fight, he's going to he's gonna do what he always does. It, he, he, I don't think you're stopping him from taking you down. His wrestling is still at a really super high level really super high level he, he's still going with great wrestlers and he's he's do, and he does well so all he has to do is bring that into the octagon with him it's so interesting to think about our fighter meeting and asking a guy so is there a piece of metal in your leg now you know because undoubtedly there is what kind of gum you smack in there ray that looks delicious <laughs> at 8 35 in the morning huh my, my throat, goodness my throat was dry i had to get a piece of gum it's Ah, all right. Seven, well, you can get your water break, you know, get your bale uh, of hay, get you some water, whatever you need, Hoss. <laughs> so sometimes when Kenny gets a haircut, he suggests that his hairdresser or his barber cuts it shorter than he wants, right? <laughs> 
How would you say she did in terms of your haircut? Shorter than you want? Or are you okay with the length? She did a fantastic job. She did. And you gave her a hundred bucks and she put it between her breasts yeah. thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was going Max. to stick it with the sun don't shine, John, but she put it in her uh, shirt. Right. That would have been hard to do, I guess, with a comb and scissors. But uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of T-notes in your wallet. You just carry hundreds. You carry like a couple thousand bucks wherever you go. I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Ray Longo looking for a fight, looking to get pickpocketed on one hip. You're an easy uh, target can, right now, actually. You're an easy target right now, actually. <laughs> I'm an easy target right now. You have thousands of dollars in cash on you, and you have one hip with which to evade. Right. Nice connection. Jesus fucking Christmas. Thanks for, All right, putting, a no. no, thanks for putting a mark on my... A mark on your what? <laughs> on his head. I think oh, yeah, right. I know. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can have him come out and come back in. It's only like the biggest week in the history of his fucking coaching career. <laughs> I can't hear you, bro. I can't hear you. Outstanding. Oh, there we'll we get him. There, we there go. There you go. Oh, you, you, you hit the mute button by accident, champ. What happened? There? You're making me a mark. <laughs> I know. I heard you say that. Yeah, very, very apologetic. Thanks for putting on my head. To give me where, where my hip is injured. I carry money on me. Still, a 2024 weapon, right? is going to be the year of Ray Longo, yeah. but 2023 may be uh, the year of Aljamain Sterling. So there's so many layers to this title fight between him and Sean O'Malley. And I think a lot, despite what you may think about me always, you know, busting your chops. But I think a lot about this Ray Longo minute and how to thoughtfully ask you about this fight to try to maybe peel back a layer of the onion. Has Aljamain Sterling faced a striker on the level of, of Sugar Sean O'Malley? Uh, it depends, uh, depends on what, uh, as far as, uh, length and, you know, uh, accuracy, no, but power wise, PD on, I think is probably a harder puncher. Um, yeah, I think just the, uh, height and accuracy, height and accuracy is what he brings to the table. And I'll probably say no, but he's never, or, 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 you know, co I mean, Sandhagen's good too. He just never got the chance to, to do anything. Um, it, it's really who O'Malley's faced that's close to Aljo, and that that's a zero. He's faced nobody well, in that at all. Right. You know so, what I'm saying? Like, Aljo's how do faced, you? Aljo's faced good strikers. O'Malley's never faced a wrestler and a striker like Aljo with the submission capabilities. Well, of course. I mean, Sean O'Malley, I think, did an interview with Brett Okamoto and basically suggested I can't let this guy anywhere near my legs. At yeah. all costs, I need that to be the focus. I certainly understand that angle to it. I guess I'm just asking you, a lifetime uh, viewer of striking, how do you rate Sean O'Malley? Because I feel pretty convicted that later in the week, Kenny's going to say an awful lot of nice things about Sean as he sets up that fight, just in terms of his distance management, his speed. You should see the kid shoot a basketball. He's a tremendous athlete. I would submit to you, this is – by a fairly significant margin, the best striker that you guys uh, have had to prepare for. Well, look, I, I, I personally love his striking. You know what I mean? But, uh, like, again, it's MMA and, you know, it's not a boxing right. match. Al Aljo does great in the boxing class with, with big guys, 55-pounders. So it's not, he's not going to be – he's not going to be in a place where he's never been before, trust me. And his pressure with the, uh, you know – with his strikes going forward, is going to be a problem. I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, who the hell knows? Like, if you're asking me, do I like Sean striking? Yeah, 100%. I, I like yeah. his fakes. I like his striking, you know. And I like his long body for Aljo to hook onto and grab him. Huh. And drag him to the floor. That I also like. You know what I mean? You got to remember, he's getting Cejudo down, who's a short, stocky guy. These longer guys... He he has he has way better chance with, with that. All he needs is one scramble, one mistake. He's on your back, and and it's going to be a long night. I just want to bring Kenny in, if I could. Kenny, a lot of Sean O'Malley's training camps have been grappling heavy camps, even if he hasn't been fighting that prototypical grappler. Right? His grappling coach is Augusto Tanquino Mendez, who Ray and Aljamain Sterling can lay claim to having a decision win over, but. Hasn't Sean O'Malley been 
working defensively to try to build himself to be ready for, for this type of challenge. And uh, to that end, like how, how capable do you think he is of handling just all the suffocation and mauling that comes with an Aljamain Sterling fight? He better be, uh, he better be in preparation for someone like Sterling. You know, I think that Sean is also kind of dangerous a- a offensively as well. He's got some good submission attacks and things like that, but I think where he is maybe weakest is positionally, right? That's kind of the glue of grappling the glue of brazilian jiu-jitsu and in contrast that's where sterling actually thrives so that's where i think he has the most ground to make up and that is a very difficult thing to do when you have a guy in aljamain sterling who's been doing that for the majority of their life their, their life and o'malley is a tremendous athlete no question about it he can get a lot done in a short amount of time but to make up that amount of time against a true specialist and someone like Sterling is going to be extremely difficult. And, and maybe he's done his, his homework enough where he can avoid, uh, you know, Aljo's rear naked choke and things like that. But positionally, he's still going to be at a deficit when it comes to combating that level of energy. And also, you know, when you have superior position, you have the ability to punch as well. And, and that's another thing that, uh, of course, O'Malley is going to have to worry about. So it, it's a tough matchup for O'Malley, uh, no question about it. But O'Malley, I think, will, will certainly have certain advantages on the feet as well because of that length, because of that speed, because of his ability to be comfortable there. Yeah. Um, but in regards to the grappling, it, it, it's one of the hardest things to learn because of sensitivity, because of time. And Sterling just has such an advantage over pretty much everyone in that division, man. And, and we saw it with, in regards to his wrestling and his takedowns against even the great Henry Cejudo. Yeah. Right. And John, you know, even, even, even Weidman, these guys have wrestled their whole lives, man. Like you put Weidman in the wrestling room. Now I guarantee you he shocks the hell. He's, he's still, you're not out wrestling him. Yeah. And I'm talking about, you know, he might lose a match to some of the top guy. I mean, even today, but, his wrestling is still, it's just inbred in these guys. You know what I mean? What they do, they're not thinking about what they do. They're just doing it, you know? And when you're training, you're not training two years to get to this level. You know, I mean, you would have to be a special person, but we didn't get that. We de- definitely didn't get any evidence of that in the Yon fight. He got taken down a couple of times or a bunch of times. Uh, and, you know, I think even if that, even if it's not linear logic and Aljo head very secure with what he's going to be able to do you know what i mean like yeah. maybe he won't but that's the game you know i think i love the way i saw around joe handle speed and length and i'm sure these guys love the way he handled you know the wrestling and the positions and the transition so now it's who can implement their game it's a pretty simple formula for this one yeah, I did happen to go back and watch O'Malley Yan last night. And you're right. I would think that Team Sterling would extract a lot of confidence from looking at some of those situations because Aljamain Sterling doesn't forfeit those positions easily. So uh, we'll see what happens coming up this weekend at UFC 292. So, Ray, in terms of your nerves, walking out for Dana White's contender series versus walking out for Weidman or Sterling – at TD Garden in Boston. Like, is your heart rate different when you're walking out for this uh, this Bantamweight fight on a Tuesday night versus at the Garden for a pay-per-view? Uh, yeah, it's going to be a little different. I think Boston, there's a lot on the plate for Boston. So, yeah, I'll be, uh, you know, my, I think my heart rate will be way higher, to be honest. All right, well, you. first Normally, things I first. I would say it's like the same. Yeah, go ahead. Cameron Smotherman is in the crosshairs for your guy, Charles Lampos Gregorio. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, Gregorio, uh, I call him Pompos, but uh, Charles Lampos, yeah. Charles Lampos. Pompos Gregorio facing Cameron Smotherman in the Bantamweight division, Dana White's Contender Series, Tuesday, August 15th. Talk to me about this matchup. Why Why should I be watching on a Tuesday night? I, I tell you, it's a great matchup. Great matchup. Very, uh, they're very, uh, you know, fairly matched up. There's a big opportunity uh, for Pompos. He's from my, I think he's from Cyprus, Greece. I'm, I probably got that wrong too. So this is a big, this is a really big deal for him. 
he's been in the gym for a bunch of years. He's trained with everybody. Uh, Rick says he's a really nice kid. Got a nice wife. It's all good. Good, man. All right, before I let you go, the only other thing I had for you was <laughs> Aljamain Sterling's. What are you laughing at now? What are you laughing at? You laughing at me? I'm, so I'm just, I'm out of my, I'm at, no, I'm definitely not laughing at you. Okay. Robert I bet you can't I'm not wait. At you. Ha, I bet you can't wait to get some water and uh, to have this interview be over and not have to deal with Palace Station <laughs> Wi Fi anymore. But the last thing I did have written down for you today. Sean O'Malley seems to be talking a lot about this Aljamain Sterling weight cut. And I think maybe the back-to-back nature of it because he just made weight for the Henry Cejudo fight 15 or so weeks ago and then went 25 hard minutes. So how does one Aljo weight cut differ from another? I believe there was a particularly tough one, maybe against Dillashaw a couple fights ago. But what can you tell us about uh, maybe the back-to-back nature of this one helping Aljo get down to that 135-pound number come Friday morning? I think Aljo is using this as motivation. Like, again, I've never seen him looking this good. My last thing I said to him before I left was, how's the weight? And he said, just like every other weight cut. So nothing's going to be different. He's going to make the weight. And, uh, you know, if he said it, I believe it. But, man, I'm telling you, I've never seen him look like this. And if that weight cut goes good and the rehigh goes good, you're in for a great fight. I guarantee you that. All right, man. Well, first things first, we hope we you take care of it. Are we, are we frozen? No, we're right good. Now? We're yeah, good. First, did you did you get a chance to see the open workout? No, I didn't get a did chance see, to see the open the workout. Clips of the open workout. Yes, I saw clips. Oh, I didn't man, see it in I mean, totality. But, yeah, standing room only at Longo Wyman MMA in Garden City. My goodness. Mob. That's got to feel good. Oh, we crushed it. Aljo, Aljo was on point. But, man, guys were FaceTiming in. And again, the people behind the people. This week's shout-out goes to JB. He FaceTimed into the uh, open workout because he couldn't make it. He had his buddy bring the phone over. So shout-out to JP. One of the Minutemen. A lot of Minutemen showed up, John. How John, about that? You might, a lot of Minutemen showed up. <laughs> they're getting angry. I bet they're, they're getting, getting angry. angry. Let me also shout-out. I want out my buddy. I want to shout out my buddy Mario Alba. He's a lawyer. He's a class action uh, lawyer. He does all my traveling stuff. He's a great guy, and he's always complaining. You shout out Joe Blow from the bar. and never shout ah. me out. So, Mario, this is your shout out, buddy. And Annika will there you forget go. your name. Mario, and so he feels good. <laughs> Mario Alba, there's your shout out. There's your fucking shout out, Mario. Took a long time for Ray to there acknowledge you your go. presence here on the Anakin Florian podcast, but there's your shout out. Hey, Ray. Have a great day and a better evening. Wish all the best. First things first, Tuesday night, Dana White's Contender Series. And then we will see you uh, in Boston. We'll see what type of response your uh, your New Yorkers get in uh, the City of Champions here in a few days. It's going to be going to be huge. I feel it already. It's going to be huge, that the acceptance we get in Boston. We're, 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 we're all the same, the East Coast guys. Come on. <laughs> when, when do you get to Boston? I get to Boston Wednesday night. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna call you when I get home, because I feel like this was. Uh, right. I didn't we'll like talk it. later. I mean, it's all good. Weird. I, the Wi-Fi thing drove me nuts. All right. No, all right, I, guys, I, I feel your pain. There he is. Thank yeah, you, brother. We appreciate it. Thank you. I'm out of here. Danny, take care, buddy. I'll see you. See you, bud. All right, the Ray Longo Minute every week here on the Anakin Florian Podcast on the DraftKings Network. If you don't know, the Minute Men is a term. That refers to Ray Longo's legion of supporters that support him through this conduit that is the Anakin Florian podcast, right? So I have a little bit of a personal rivalry with the Minutemen because I feel like the Ray Longo Minute segment maybe is a little bit overrated relative to the rest of the Anakin Florian podcast. So I've gone back and forth at these people a little bit over the years, and uh, I stand by everything I say. I do think Ray's segment has gotten pretty pretty good, though. It's getting better every week. But a couple of things I just wanted to say sort of on the way out. So the amount of venom that is out there for Aljamain Sterling, our undisputed UFC Bantamweight champion, is pretty crazy. And it's hard for me to grasp why there isn't more public acknowledgement of his skills. And maybe I'm just leaning too much into a vocal minority. 
But when I pose the question as to who is the greatest bantamweight in UFC history, excuse me, greatest bantamweight in mixed martial arts history, most of these people say Dominic Cruz. And this isn't necessarily a two-headed race, even though I think those are the only two guys in the conversation. But it's amazing to me that just by nature of the way he won the belt against Piotr Jan, being the first fighter in UFC history to win an undisputed championship via DQ, I just think it laid the foundation for a lot of people to just not acknowledge the body of work. Aljamain Sterling has 15 UFC wins, right? Dominic Cruz may be my best friend in the MMA space, but Aljamain Sterling has more UFC wins than Dom has UFC and WEC wins combined. And when you look at Aljamain Sterling's win list, Kenny, wins list, Dillashaw's on there, Corey Sandhagen's on there, Henry Cejudo's on there, Piotr Jan is on there twice. He beat Henan Burrell back in the day. He beat Cody Stamen with an unbelievable submission. He has more finishes than most of these Bantamweights, not named Marlon Chito Vera. And I don't bring this up in closing out this episode to have the conversation about him versus Cruz. I just bring it up because it is mind-numbing to me the amount of disrespect that is out there for the best 135-pound fighter in the world who right now is a 3-to-1 favorite to beat maybe the biggest superstar in the game right now in Sean O'Malley. Yeah, I think it's a combination of of a few different things. I think the fact that Aljo has had some bad luck in regards to that first Piotr Jan fight, right, with the DQ. Then there was the, you know, the TJ Dillashaw shoulder injury. So it was like, uh, did Aljo really win those fights? Well, there was this there was this injury, there was this thing that happened, yada yada yada. Um I, I think those were kind of some unfortunate circumstances that the fans will point to. Um, the other thing is Aljo isn't that guy where he's a charismatic character like his opponent on Saturday night, a Sean O'Malley or a Conor McGregor, where he's out and about and, you know, he he knows how to grab a mic and just hype himself up uh, to the point where either fans are you know, so excited about, it. you know, he doesn't have that. He, he's I think he's true to himself in that regard. Um, he goes to a lot of the fights and this and that, but he's not out there just hyping himself and doing this. And I, and I think that probably has something to do with it as well. And then, you know, he will bite back at fans as well, you know, which will kind of make things uh, a little bit, um, you know, contentious there. But as far as his body of work, what he's done, who he's beaten, the manner in which he's done it, uh, you know, his, his overall skill level, I, I think that... Um, he can't be denied uh, as the greatest bantamweight of all time, I think, at this stage. Um, and, it, you know, if he goes out there and defeats an awesome striker like Sean O'Malley, I think it just strengthens the argument that much more. So, um, yeah, I mean, I find that the general population or what is like uh, what is like generally the accepted, uh, you know, opinion about a certain thing. In my opinion, a lot of times is kind of wrong, uh, right? Because, you know, when you're talking about a highly technical sport, like something like mixed martial arts, I think the opinion that matters most are Aljo's peers, right? His fellow fighters who have right. been in the game and know how difficult it is. You know, you've been around this game forever. You've seen a lot of great fighters come and go, champions, et cetera, et cetera. So you have something to compare to. Uh, of being there, of, of sensing that energy. But I agree. I don't think he's as appreciated as he should be. And I think he's one of those guys, similar to Dominic Cruz, by the way, who was not yeah. appreciated that much when he was the champion. Now that we look back, we can kind of say that. But I think Aljo is most likely going to have one of those careers that when you look back, he's way more appreciated than he is you know, in his current state. And you're right. And you put it well, as usual. And a lot of that love for Cruzy is coming in right now. And it certainly warms my heart when I am quoted as saying Aljamain Sterling, in my mind, is the greatest bandweight of all time. It warms my heart to see all that love out there for Dominic Cruz. Overwhelmingly, I can't wait to see Dom again and have this conversation with him. Dom's case is rooted in the fact that he beat TJ Dillashaw in 2016 in Boston to become a two-time UFC Bantamweight champion. To lose that belt, not in the octagon, and then regain it with all the injuries, and then, of course, building the division the way he did. Again, Cruz has a very strong case. I just would like to see Sterling's skills be acknowledged. And for Kamar Usman, for a while, he was that boring guy, and then he yep. knocks out the boxer Jorge Masvidal, and then he never has to hear that again. So maybe a knockout in this setting against Sean O'Malley would be useful for Aljamain Sterling. But... 
the guy has really done a lot of things. And uh, I do believe if he adds a win over Sean O'Malley, who I think is the best striker he's ever faced this weekend, then how do you deny him then? But I know yet still a lot of people will. Yep. All right. PFL coming up August 18th, Friday night. Ken Flo will be in New York. Henan Fareda and Maurice Green, the men on the marquee. Larissa Pacheco is back, as is the Olympic gold medalist Satoshi Ishii. Of course, we will be back with you. Another episode coming up Thursday on DraftKings Network and on the DraftKings YouTube channel as well. Thank you all for getting the word out about the show. Thank you for voting for the show in the best MMA programming category for the World MMA Awards. And thanks, of course, to Fighters Only for the acknowledgement. WorldMMAAwards.com if you want to get behind the movement and vote for the podcast podcast this year uh we certainly appreciate that and we will be back in about 72 hours we'll have the action man chris curtis we'll have brian petrie and ken flo's picks for uh for ufc 292 best of luck to ray longo thanks to our producer cody marrow and thanks to our entire team at DraftKings for helping put it all together for ken flo i'm john anik we'll talk to you in uh in three days until then yo later Time I start a verse, I break at least three commandments. Kinda like Pluto because I never plan it. I'm outlandish in the way they make the patches look like they own ranches. It's the art of war, your blood's the only color on the canvas. And I don't mean it like a thug sense of how you can get got. Fuck being gangsta, I'm hip hop. You got it every time you walk in the label. The A&R's like not it. Immune to your shit because I circle, circle, dot, dot it. Body heat is intoxic, we got a beat, I don't got it. Speak copies, he start to think like psychically, make the speakers speak elitistly. Off the high horse, make an ass of their views. Your DJ must not know the alphabet for getting his cues. My favorite DJ got the those are six extra L's to abuse. Esoteric John P and I'm the new kid at school. I'm Ray to Ellis. Nice to meet you. Show busting my styles. Egocentric, ego tripping with frequent fly smiles. DJ wants to get in the bird. He gets in the bird. And bird takes the shot. He's- you want to see?